Hi, I'm Matt Parker. I'm Steve Mould. I'm Helen Arney and this is another episode of A Podcast of Unnecessary Detail. And for the people who have made it this far through the series, because you listen sequentially, you know that the title is not ironic. And for all our new listeners who've just jumped in now, uh, don't worry, it is ironic. This is actually a grossly under-detailed podcast <laughs> about sport. <laughs> okay, well... And popular films? Yeah. I thought it was a true crime podcast. Yeah, two crime and relationship. <laughs> wow, that's a bad mix. Well, this episode of A Podcast of Unnecessary Detail is called Lock and Key, uh, which means we're talking about things that fit perfectly into other things. And if you think that sounds rude, that reveals more about you and the kind of podcast you listen to than it does reveal about us. <laughs> so I'll be talking about how our immune systems work. I'll be talking about how jigsaw puzzles work and not just how the pieces fit together, how those pieces don't fit our expectations. Oh. And I will be sharing something that I wrote for Matt's YouTube channel, which fits perfectly with something that someone else wrote for Matt's YouTube channel. And none of those people were me. <laughs> okay, let's lock in some detail. So I took lock and key to be very much things that fit snugly together. Which, um, and maybe th th this is just because it's at the front of my mind at the moment. It made me think of jigsaw puzzles. Like locking lots of pieces together in a lock and key fashion. And the reason that I was already obsessed with jigsaw puzzles is because I um, bought one recently and realized that they lie on the packaging. What? In fact, I would be prepared to say... Probably almost half, over half of all jigsaws lie on their packaging. They tell you an incorrect number of pieces. So I bought a jigsaw. Can I just check? The picture is yep. the same. <laughs> it's... The picture's correct. Yes. No, oh, they're not doing a, that'd be hilarious, doing a, a sneaky swap of the picture. Or just a bit in the corner is just completely different. So you've done most of it and you're like, I just, I just can't work out what's happening over there. That would be so good. You should do a jigsaw puzzle where one corner is different to what's on the box, but it's a repeat of a different part of the same picture. Oh, no. <laughs> there's so much wrong about and that. And there's definitely a market for this because as I discovered during my jigsaw adventure, there's a whole jigsaw YouTube community of people of course who is. solve and discuss and review jigsaw puzzles. It's so good. Uh, but I don't, I don't want to skip ahead. But, um, Steve, we sell a jigsaw puzzle on Maskia, which is a jigsaw yes, puzzle do. of a jigsaw puzzle. And I got a professional <laughs> jigsaw puzzle reviewer <laughs> to have a look at it. And uh, I forget, what was the exact phrasing? It's like, too much puzzle dust. So, oh, in, in the manufacturing process, you get, like, this jigsaw puzzle dust from the way it's cut out. Oh. And that's one of the scales that a jigsaw puzzle is reviewed on is the amount of, of piece <laughs> dust. Wow. And, yeah. So no matter so, how good the jigsaw uh, is, if you have to spend the rest of the day hoovering up, then it gets a lower mark. Exactly. Right? I get it. Now, the jigsaw puzzle I bought was a 200-piece jigsaw puzzle, and it's got that in big letters on the box, 200 pieces, 200. Zero, zero. If you actually count the number of pieces, there are 204. No. What? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Let me get my pitchfork because this is not going to stand. And exactly. You cannot let this <laughs> No. <happen. laughs> but are they, are they understating a feature? Like, are they downplaying? Like, is 204 better? If you wanted to do this puzzle correctly, the 200-piece puzzle, you'd have to pick four pieces and just throw them in the bin with all the dust <laughs> and be like, you, you may as well be puzzle dust. You're puzzle dust to me. This feels like something very different from you buy a packet of pasta or something and it says approximately... 500 grams and you just think you know one bit of pasta yeah. might take it a couple of grams over one less bit of pasta i'm not going to complain it'll be two grams under fine whatever this is four whole pieces that's like four no, whole it's, it's not a manufacturing it's like toilet it's not like someone scooping bits of jigsaw puzzle into the pack <laughs> yeah, that's not and happening. some settling occurs in transit no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no they're, they're they're very specific put in 204 exact pieces and um, well, the reason is 200 
has terrible factors. Oh. Uh. So I'm talking specifically about jigsaw puzzles that are a grid. And you can get all sorts of crazy piece patterns. I'm talking about the ones where, you know, each one's got four edges and they have the innies and outies and they all lock together in a grid to make a puzzle. And 200 yeah. doesn't have good factors, whereas 204 has some really nice factors. Oh. And so they switch from the advertised number to the real number so they can have a better ratio grid for the puzzle. So in, in the case of my puzzle, they wanted it to be... So on the packet, it says in big letters that the finished puzzle is 49 centimeters by 36 centimeters, which means it's got an aspect ratio of 1.36. There are no yeah. factors of 200 which are anywhere near that ratio but 204 has the factors among other factors of 17 and 12 so 17 times 12 is 204 and 17 and 12 if you have a grid in that ratio a grid that 17 pieces across by 12 pieces high that's an aspect ratio of 1.42 and it's very close to the aspect ratio of the picture that's on the puzzle. And so by having a few more pieces, they can have a grid, which is way closer to the picture they want to have. If they stuck with 200 pieces, I mean, what are you going to do with two? I mean, a 200 piece puzzle could be one piece by 200. <laughs> what? Just for completeness. <laughs> what were you pitching, Steve? Two, two by 100. You could have two by 100. That would be a jigsaw puzzle. I was genuinely, as you were talking, thinking, well, a 20 by 10 piece jigsaw doesn't sound horrific, but it's kind of two to one aspect ratio. That's like a widescreen yep. movie. So if you were doing a jigsaw of a still from a modern Hollywood movie, you'd be fine. But any normal size picture, yeah. you'd, you'd, it's kind of no. uncanny valley. It just It's a bit uncomfortable. You're like, why it's is way this too wide jigsaw screen. so wide? And that's the best case. Wait, hold on a second. Hold yep. on a second, Matt. Are you suggesting... If, if the numbers are difficult, are they going to make a super wide jigsaw puzzle or are they going to make a normal shaped jigsaw puzzle, but where all the pieces have been squished? Yeah, well, this is the other option. Oh. So Helen's 10 by 20 is the best case scenario for 200, but it's still ah, like okay. two to one widescreen. If you wanted to get that back to a normal picture ratio, you could just squash all the pieces. And to make yeah. that work, the pieces would have to be 1.47 ratio, which means they're about one and a half times as long as they are wide. I'm just going to put oh, myself in the mind of a jigsaw puzzle doer. Yep. I'd say that is not what I want from a jigsaw because it gives you <laughs> the information about which direction the piece Correct. is going in. Yeah. It makes it too easy. You yep. want your pieces yeah, to be square, right. so it's a challenge. Yeah, the closer yeah. they are to square, the more number of rotations they could have the better the puzzle if they're super skinny it takes half the you know you already know you've halved the number of orientations they could have before they go <laughs> it's in it's easier but it's less satisfying and i think if yeah. you're doing a jigsaw puzzle the satisfaction is more important than the ease like the ease. on a regular yeah. basis literally weekly at the moment well it's twice weekly at the moment because my dad's not doing very much my dad sends pictures of the jigsaws he's finished so <laughs> my life has been full of a lot of jigsaws throughout my That's life good. and so it's still good. full of jigsaws now through my dad who's obsessive so uh, this i really get this this is bringing up like quite a lot of memories <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't introduce your dad to jigsaw youtube no. oh, you never get him absolutely back absolutely don't want to do that it's not gonna happen <laughs> oh you can smell the puzzle dust just thinking about it um <laughs> so so by switching from 200 pieces to 204, for 200 pieces, they'll be about one and a half times as long as they are wide. For 204 pieces, they're within, they're about 4% off being a square, the pieces. Yeah, that's nice. And so the, the, the manufacturers have made the decision. They're like, oh, you know what? We'll just do that. We'll, we'll go for more pieces. Now, I, I've described it as they chuck in four extra pieces to make the maths work. And people got very upset about that because it's still the same amount of jigsaw puzzle. You've just divided mm. it. It's not like there's the puzzle and they're putting in. But in my mind, they're putting in four more. But in reality, they're just making each piece smaller area to get the same amount. Because you're prioritizing the numbers over the 
picture. Yeah, but surely yeah. a jigsaw puzzle is the doing, and you've got to put more pieces together. I don't understand the psychology of it. Like, mm. why is it better to see the number 200 on a box than 204 on a box? Obviously, 200 is a nice round number, but 204 is a bigger number. Well, I spoke <laughs> to um, Karen, who's a uh, YouTube jigsaw puzzler, Karen Puzzles, and she told uh, me there was a manufacturer who tried being honest. And instead of saying, this is a 200 piece, they'd say, this is a 204 piece. And jigsaw puzzlers would laugh at them because that's an embarrassingly small number of pieces. So like for the bigger ones, <laughs> so like your 1500 piece, I got a 1500 piece jigsaw puzzle, 1530 pieces. Oh, that's a lot. extra 30 put in there. And there was one manufacturer that, Put the put the honest numbers. So instead of a thousand, they put a thousand and eight, or whatever the ratios actually are. Um, and then they changed. They went back to doing it the rounded multiples of ten way. So I don't know what the psychology is. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. But a company did try to do it correctly, and then they backtracked. So there must be some kind of cost in in the marketplace of jigsaw wow. puzzles. If you're being yeah. accurate on your... If you're not lying, fewer people will buy your jigsaw puzzles, which Accuracy is outrageous. Accuracy hit the bottom line. Maybe yeah. they did some market research. They put all the pieces together and realized that people wanted a round number. Excellent. Excellent <laughs> jigsaw <laughs> reference. I'm so sorry. I just sneaked those. No, no dust on uh, that joke. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a jigsaw here, Matt, because I currently record this podcast from my bedroom because my husband has um, is holding my office hostage. And has done for the last two and a half years. Um, I've got a jigsaw because this is my <laughs> yep. daughter's favourite jigsaw. And we have to keep it Aww. in our bedroom because otherwise um, my son, who is younger, tries to get hold of it and eat all the pieces. Because gotcha. it's, yes, it's clearly his familiar. favourite jigsaw as well, but for different reasons. I thought you were going to say she's trying to go cold turkey on that jigsaw puzzle. So you've had to hide it away. I mean, he's <laughs> licked all the puzzle dust off it already. So I've no idea how it ranks on puzzle dust. But I've got to tell you, it's an amazing jigsaw. Let's it's, grab it. What does it promise? It's quite old. It's actually, it was secondhand from a, um, a family friend. And it's the Galt Giant Magic Puzzle of Ancient Egypt. I love um, it. And the good Ooh. things about it is it's a massive picture kind of a cartoon of um, everything that happened in ancient Egypt. And it's got little black bits. And if you put your finger over it, they warm up and reveal bonus picture underneath. Wow. It's toddler catnip. Good. It's just so good. It's such a good jigsaw. But it does say 80 pieces. 80, and now I'm starting to worry. Well, that's not good. Yeah. 80, what's, what would that be? Four by, yeah. what, eight by 10? Eight by ten. Yeah, eight by, eight by ten feels good. Eight by ten. Do you want the actual many, ratios what, that it says, Matt? What, what dimension does it claim it is? Yeah. Um, inches or centimeters. For the first time in my life, I don't have a strong preference because <laughs> I'm just going to calculate a ratio between the two, wow. and the units cancel out. I feel like that's some kind of headline for this episode of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Matt has no opinion between metric and imperial ratios. Okay. Um. Uh, 68 by 46 centimetres. 68 by 46. And so what I'm doing now is when I realised that jigsaw puzzles were lying, I was like, well, if I was given a jigsaw puzzle, like you've just done then, Helen, yeah, I should be able to write some code to work out every possible factor of 80, all the <laughs> ratios how close or far away they are, and then check other numbers near 80 to see if they have a better ratio. And so I wrote... Yeah, you should be able to do that, but why would you? Because <laughs> now I've made Jig, the Jigsaw Inference Gizmo, and Jig oh, tries God. to like predict... Steve has never met Matt before in his whole life. <laughs> it has got that air to it, doesn't it? Okay, so... Your jigsaw puzzle ratio is 1.48-ish. i got to tell you, the pictures on the front of the individual pieces look very square to me. So I'm expecting oh, a pretty square number. Because you're right. 8 by 10 is the best ratio. Ooh. But you would need pieces that are in a ratio of 1.18. So they're like 18% off being mm. square. That's not great. It's not ideal. If you had 88 pieces, you could do 8 by 11 and that gets you down to 7.5% off square. So, 
That looks or, more like it. 18% actually, looks too much for the picture of the pieces. So 8 by 11 is what Jig thinks the case is. If the manufacturer was prepared to go below 80, 77 pieces is really good. Because 7, seven by, 11. by 11 gets you within 6.3% a square. Hmm. Probably not enough to make it worthwhile. Jig's final prediction is 8 by 11, 88 pieces. Well, does it prove this is a real jigsaw? There it like, is. You can hear could it you, rattling. Um, could you pull out a piece and see how close to square it is? I will. I, I'm now starting to doubt whether the picture on the front is actually accurate. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, we are going to find out, aren't we? We better. You're going to count. Oh, we okay. know. Um, now I'm holding up a, a piece. Oh, and, actually, oh, that looks pretty rectangular. It does. Yeah, that does I think not that look might like be 8 by 10. It doesn't look like the illustration on the front. So even if it is correct about having 80 pieces, the portrayal of the individual pieces on the front is, is grossly misleading. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Jigsaw manufacturers just have no integrity. They just it's, play fast I mean, and loose. They're playing a they're real fast and loose. The whole thing's a scam. Yeah. Oh. When I count these pieces later with my daughter, we're going to get some serious disappointment yeah. if there's not exactly 80 pieces. Could you get your daughter to solve it for us and give us the ratio, the grid ratio of how many pieces by how many pieces? If you so give us can, about 45 uh, minutes. Get to the bottom of this. <laughs> yeah. Looking at that piece, I can almost... It's definitely going to be 8 by 10. Yeah, I mean, I can do a little... I found three pieces for the edge, and I can sort of do a little look at the picture. And uh, I reckon if you measured them up, if they're about 1.2 times as long as they are wide, high, then yeah, I've then got some bad news. It, it looks like these three side pieces take up about three-eighths of the amount of the picture. <laughs> there you go. I'm going to prove it for sure later. So oh, oh, what yeah. I've got here is we, we actually have no concept of how truthful this particular puzzle company is because they appear to have been accurate about the number on the front. Although we have found some errors, yeah. the, the, the image of the pieces on the front, not good. Also, on the back, yeah. it's translated into several different languages. And in the Italian translation, yeah. it says 60 pieces. I mean, I wouldn't trust any of the history they're trying to teach yeah. children. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, here's the last thing, Steve. I then realized that we sell this jigsaw puzzle on Maskia and I'd never yeah. counted the number of pieces. I assume you never counted the number of pieces. <gasps> no. No. We could be complicit in this whole thing. We're, we're part of the jigsaw puzzle supply chain and yeah, we, we didn't do our due diligence. So yeah. we claim to have a thousand pieces. The jigsaw puzzle is 33 centimeters by 22.8 centimeters, a picture ratio of 1.48. We have... 1,000 pieces in a 25 by 40 ratio, which is not great. They're 10.5% off being square, and there are uh, 1,008 would have been better. But some manufacturers err on fudging the number of pieces to make them more square, and others lean into having the correct number of pieces and don't care about how square they are. So for the one we yeah. sell, it, we don't have to go through with a Sharpie and change every single box. <laughs> Oh, thank Which was the other option. I was like, oh, please, no. I don't have to like get stickers printed, like correction stickers <laughs> to put on everything. Also, you'd need to get a sticker for the box, but because it's a jigsaw puzzle of the jigsaw puzzle box, yep. you would have to get stickers. You'd have to get stickers all the way down. For... <laughs> so we're okay. We're okay. <laughs> There's exactly a thousand pieces. Thank God we don't have to print an infinite number of stickers <laughs> getting smaller and smaller. I do not want to get a quote for infinitely many stickers. Well, yeah, but they they converge. The printed area converges. <laughs> yeah, it's a finite area. I'm glad you're not complicit in uh, big jigsaws no. takeover of maps. It's scary. We could have been. Yeah. We just got lucky. We hadn't checked. We but we were, we were on the right side. We are on the right side of Egyptian history. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Steve, how does what you're talking about fit in? I've got no shame. No shame. No, it's good. It's a good one. I want to talk about my favorite part of the immune system. And by the way, the immune system, it's all about lock and key. You've probably heard the lock and key analogy used in a biological context quite a lot. For example, the way we smell. So in your nasal cavity, there are these olfactory cells. On the surface of the olfactory cells, there are these big molecules, these proteins, all different shapes. 
and they're the lock in this analogy. When you take a breath, or when you sniff, it fills your nasal cavity with swirling molecules. And some of those molecules that are swirling around in your nasal cavity, they may be the lock that goes with that key. Oh, hang on, hang on. What's the lock? What's the key? The inside of your nose is the lock and the smell so the is the key. the inside of my, my nasal cavity is covered in locks. Yes. I take a big old breath of keys. You take a big old breath of keys. <laughs> they swirl around in a room full of yeah. locks and yeah. some of them just happen to chunk. I don't know about you, Matt, but this sounds incredibly inefficient. It does. Why I don't mean, you what? have one lock that can be opened with multiple keys or one key that it well, can open multiple locks? I'm not sure if you mean the way we smell is inefficient or Steve's analogy is inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> It's not I would my say, analogy. Everyone imagine uses it. <laughs> your nasal cavity is the frame of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, I don't like it when Matt goes first. He's too sassy for the rest of us. I know, yeah. People can't see this, but I've leant right back in my chair and I'm just, <laughs> I'm here to judge. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, if I can get back on track, for example, maybe putrescine diaminobutane is swirling around in there. And that happens to match exactly with a specific molecule on a specific olfactory cell. And so when the lock and the key meet, it activates the olfactory cell. That sends a signal to your brain and that turns into you thinking, ooh, rotten fish. Because (laughs) putrescine diaminobutane is one of the things that makes up the smell of rotten fish. Wow. I mean, Helen and I were making fun of Steve, but he's showing up with receipts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say isoamyl acetate, which would have had the punchline, ooh, bananas. But I thought I'd go with rotten ah. fish instead. But yeah, so different locks for different keys. And, and that's how your sense of smell works. But actually, the lock and key analogy is really useful for a lot of different processes in the human body, especially the immune system. I'm sure you know this. You have these immune cells that are basically patrolling your body. So they're sloshing around and they're looking for pathogens. And I mean, looking for is anthropomorphizing the cells. They're not actually looking for anything. They're just bumping around. But the way they behave is almost indistinguishable from intent. So I'm happy to anthropomorphize oh, wow. on this occasion. I'm sure everyone else is as well, especially Matt. Yep. Okay, good. And what's a pathogen? So a pathogen, what, like a virus or a bacteria or a thing, a, a exactly. not cool thing. Yeah, a thing that you don't want in your body because it might hurt you um, and it's alive. Uh, oh, so well, you're gosh, saying... I mean, viruses, are they alive? I don't know. Oh, I mean, don't, I'm talking don't. about viruses, <laughs> bacteria, if, fungus. If anyone wants to have that is... debate about whether viruses are alive, you can go and listen to series one because we have it there. <laughs> it's done. We finished with that. Move on. It's done. They are alive. So what, um, what I took is your analogy is accurate enough. It's indistinguishable from being anthropomorphizing. <laughs> yeah, great. So we may as well describe it that way. Exactly. Thank you. You weren't looking for it, strictly speaking. I can't tell if you're cussing out my analogy or not. It's very sophisticated. Indistinguishable. (laughs) (laughs) So, how do these immune cells detect pathogens? Just like your olfactory cells, they have on the surface a big old molecule that is for detecting a particular molecule found on pathogens. So... For example, a virus turns up in your body and a virus is typically some genetic material surrounded by a case made of proteins that's called a capsid. And so different immune cells are going to be bumping into this virus. One comes along, bumps into it, nothing happens. Another one comes along, bumps into it, nothing happens. But eventually an immune cell comes along that has a lock according to our analogy, that exactly matches the protein that makes up the case that surrounds this viral DNA. And when those two come together, the key fits the lock, it activates the immune cell, and that causes a whole cascade of things to happen that is your body mounting a response to the virus. But here's the problem. There are billions of different ways to be a virus or to be a bacteria. In other words, there are billions of different proteins that you can build that would act as 
a good case for your virus DNA or would act as a good sticky out protein on your bacteria or, or, or whatever it is. There are just billions of ways to do it. So we need billions of different immune cells f with billions of different locks for all these different keys. And I'm assuming that even the virus put on a different disguise, a capsid, yeah. just the nature of you know chemistry at that scale, there's going to be sticky out bits. Or are, yeah. they, or are they used for something? Does the virus use those? Or is that just like a byproduct of wearing molecules at that scale? Yeah, so viruses, they have their protective shell, but they usually have some other functional proteins as well. For example, coronavirus, COVID-19, let's say, has um, the spike protein. And the spike protein is coronavirus's mechanism for attaching to our cells ah, and right. breaking into our cells. So they bind to the ACE2 receptors on the cells in our respiratory system. So they're going well, to try and find, <laughs> and anthropomorphizing again, normal <laughs> cells. They're, they're not using that spike protein to try and find immune system cells. No. They're trying to use that protein to attach themselves to our normal cells and yes. do bad stuff. That's right. So immune cells can be activated by capsid proteins or they can be acted by the spike proteins or, or whatever proteins that the virus uses and, and the same is true for bacteria bacteria is going to have proteins on its surface as well for different things so we need billions of different immune cells with billions of different locks to detect these billions of different possible protein keys that you find on these pathogens so how do we make these billions of different immune cells well, maybe you need a gene for each one. So we need billions of genes. But you might know that the human genome is made of around 25,000 genes, not billions of genes. So how do we make all these different varieties? And this is brilliant. So when immune cells are being manufactured in the body, there's a little bit of our DNA, a section that our body can use as a kind of pick and mix. So... <laughs> When the immune cells are being created, our body just picks bits of DNA from this segment, shuffles them together, and what it ends up with, it uses that to produce the protein that then sits on the surface of the immune cell. So it's like shuffling a deck of cards to produce all these different proteins. The challenge, though, is when you're recombining bits of DNA like this to produce novel proteins for detecting pathogenic proteins, you might end up producing proteins that detect stuff that your body produces, things that aren't pathogens. And if those new immune cells were set loose in your body, they would latch onto your own cells, they would be activated, and your immune system would produce a response to the cells of your own body, and that's an autoimmune response. So how do you avoid this autoimmune response? Well, we don't fully avoid it obviously because it's that's a thing that happens to people but we actually have a system and this is my favorite part of the body it's the thymus there's a little organ sits just above your heart and just slightly forward of your heart and all t cells which is a type of immune cell all t cells have to pass through the thymus before they're allowed into the body and it's like running the gauntlet they get pushed through these tubes that are lined with cells that present different proteins from your own body. Huh. And if you want to pass the test, you have to ignore all of it as you what? pass through. So imagine you're a T-cell, you've been given one of these proteins, you're floating through this tube, you're being presented with all these proteins from your, from your own body, and you latch onto one of them. You go, yay, I found something. <laughs> that's, not, uh -oh. that's, that's bad. Nope. Yeah. That's not good. Then, the thymus then sends a signal to the cell saying, kill yourself. <laughs> and actually, most of the T cells don't make it because obviously it errs on the side of caution, let's say. Yeah. Because um, your body has loads of proteins in it that do loads of stuff. Yeah. So surely yeah. it's as easy to produce something that yeah. attaches itself to something in your body as, as something from outside. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. And what's great is it works for mutations in our proteins as well. So if a cell in your body mutates and starts producing novel proteins, your immune system will likely detect that and kill that cell. And that's one of our ways of defending against cancer. 
So let me get this straight. Your immune system has no idea what pathogens may show up. Yes. And so it's like, let's just assemble a random army because we're going to shuffle this deck of protein detection bits, build just random immune system soldiers. But they, on the way out, they have to meet and greet every authorized protein and not kill any of them. Yeah. And so we just filter out all the ones that would go AWOL <laughs> and the ones that make it out and then just free to cruise around the body and do what they want and hopefully detect. Yeah. It, it's a bit like a visiting dignitary, you know. They have to shake everyone's hand down a line, except you have to not <laughs> shake anyone's hand. <laughs> if you do shake anyone's hand, they drag you out of the queue and, and throw you in the bin. You know what it made me think of? You see these videos on YouTube of dogs at like dog competitions. And they, they have like a row, the dog has to walk down and there's treats and distractions on both sides. <laughs> yeah. And the dog has to ignore all of the, and there's all sorts of videos of like the dog just being like, oh my goodness, there's free stuff everywhere. And then just, <laughs> just taking all of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So you want a well-trained cell that's just going to pass right down the middle and ignore all the protein treats. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah, but Got if it. we follow your analogy, what you're doing is you're getting thousands upon thousands of dogs and repeating that experiment, and only one of them makes it onto YouTube. <laughs> I mean, that's, the that's rest one way. Really badly. One way to get a trained dog. Yeah. But it's grossly inefficient <laughs> in the yeah. number of it's dogs very, required. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just re splicing the DNA from each dog is time consuming. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. You know what's brilliant? Brilliant. It's a site where you can learn interactively with fun, hands-on lessons in maths, science, maths, computer science, and some maths. And interactive learning is way more effective than just watching lecture videos or listening to podcasts. Wait, is that true? It is. Wow. There you are. So you better check out the fantastic, interactive, and oh my goodness, so visually pleasing courses over on Brilliant.org. You want to learn logic? No problem. They have a course called Logic. It's a very logical title. And instead of just memorizing things, it teaches you how to think by guiding you through fun problems. Each of those problems comes with step-by-step solutions that help you understand the reasoning behind it all. So join the literally millions of people, and I mean literally, who are all learning the brilliant way. And if you go to brilliant.org slash A-P-O-U-D or click the link in the description, the first 200 of our listeners will get 20% off an annual membership. So there you are. Go. Get started for free with Brilliant's amazing interactive lessons. Helen, don't just give us the key points. <laughs> tell, us, <laughs> tell us the whole thing. Right, I'm going to start with asking you to look at a website. Obviously, if you're listening at home, do this in your own time, like not when you're driving or whatever. Um, it's a website called thingsfittingperfectlyintothings.tumblr.com. <laughs> Oh, right. If yeah. you could look that I'm, up for me. I'm familiar me. with their work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know this. We all know this website. It's oh, this a website a where website. pictures of things fitting perfectly into, on top of, or next to, or inside other things have been posted. Uh, can you both pick a favorite example and I'll pick mine? Oh, my. It's oh, I've already got it one. down. Is it, is it the protractor? No, mine is the knob from an oven that fits perfectly over a knob in a car. So it's the AC <laughs> dial. And I, I just love it because like, you know, a knob breaks off on your car and you're like, well, I'm screwed now. Hold on a second. Let me just see if, if the knob from my oven. Well, what's great is presumably this person is also using their oven. So they just have to carry it between the car and that. Every day. It's like, presumably they have it with their keys, you know. And they just yeah. take it with them wherever they go. But there's another level because like your air con, you want it to go from what, you know, at minimum 10 degrees at maximum 30 degrees, whatever climate you're in. <laughs> but you've got it going from like 50 to 250 degrees centigrade. That's that's not helpful. Yeah, yeah. it's very confusing in that way. It fits, but it, it doesn't fit. <laughs> Whereas I picked the protractor that someone noticed is exactly half of a coaster, like a circular coaster oh, they've got. Oh, nice. That is one of my favorites. They just put the protractor on the coaster. It's not useful. It's not helpful. <sighs> but it's very pleasing. Yeah. yeah. That's the feeling I get from looking at this website. I find it very calming 
because people have found things that fit perfectly. There's there's one of an Oreo biscuit uh, or cookie, depends where you're from, uh, fitting perfectly into like a tube pack for something else entirely. That like a six pack of like mento sweets and really? an Oreo fits like oh perfectly inside as if oh as if someone has standardized snacks and I find it very satisfying um, and that's why I brought it up because I feel like I'm going to talk about music and I'm going to talk about creating music and I wanted to get everyone to get that feeling of when a piece of music fits with another piece of music and how satisfying that is oh, lovely. is a similar feeling to seeing a protractor that is exactly half the size of a coaster and and seeing that fit together so even if you're not a musician you can still enjoy the fact that two things are fitting together in the most perfect possible way and you can get all of the endorphins from that experience. Helen, I think I'm going to need to close this website because I thought I was listening to what you're saying. <laughs> but actually, I'm just looking at a gas canister fitting perfectly into a whey powder tub. <laughs> so I'm just going to, I'm going to shut this down. Otherwise, we're not going yeah. to be able to carry on. Okay, look, right. Okay, let's close it down. I was just going to tell on Steve for still looking at the website. That, <laughs> that obvious from your face. <laughs> <laughs> what the way his eyes were moving around the screen and then yeah. like his pupils his little, were widening his little giddy happy face <laughs> yeah. yeah i was dribbling slightly <laughs> right so this uh, section has a dual purpose one of them is to bring everyone listening some satisfaction of a piece of music that fits perfectly into another piece of music mm. but also it's my way of addressing why my daughter and most of the known universe are in love with a song from a Disney movie musical. And the song is called We Don't Talk About Bruno. I I'm knew you were going to say that. All, you all know. Yeah. Never heard this, of it. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, I mean, Matt, you're just very not with it. It's from Encanto. Exactly. And Steve, I'm assuming you've listened to Encanto a number of times. Uh, it's around 500 now, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm really just starting to appreciate the nuance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there is a lot. This is the thing, right? Um, whether it is love or Stockholm Syndrome, <laughs> in our household, we listen to and watch a lot of Encanto. And I absolutely appreciate, I think on a, a level that I haven't myself yet appreciated, the song We Don't Talk About Bruno, because it's like an international sensation. Everyone in TikTok's doing versions of it. Mm. And it is this most extraordinary, complicated song that has about six different characters singing six different tunes. And they all get introduced near the beginning of the song and they sing their tune. And by the end of the song, they're all singing their melodies on top of each other. And there's a whole bunch of other things going on. And it still makes sense to someone listening. It's this incredible accumulation of all these ideas from the beginning of the song that then all mash together at the end. But rather than it sounding like a total nightmare, it it makes sense. It's like a perfectly woven structure of all these different characters and all these different melodies and all these different musical things going on in a single song. It's wow. it's frankly extraordinary that it has appeared in a film that is basically for kids. So I think I haven't been appreciating this song at all, in fact. <laughs> well, you have, but that's the other thing about it, right? It, it's also a really fun song to listen to just on the surface. Yeah. But when you start to dig down into what's actually going on, your appreciation for it only grows. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that what I've done is similar to <laughs> the epic We Don't Talk About Bruno Pinnacle of contrapuntal character writing. No, I'm saying that I've done a very tiny version of it, but yet in myself, I am still extremely proud of it. And the only reason I've done it is because Matt asked me to. Matt, I wonder if you could share the reason that I wrote a song that fits perfectly with a song that someone else has already written for you. And for the record, <laughs> I asked very nicely, just so we're yes, clear on that. Yes, you did. Um, so, so there's a wonderful individual named Howard Carter who wrote the, the the theme song to this podcast, wrote all our special spoken nerd music. They also yep. wrote the theme song for the Stand Up Mass YouTube channel. So all my videos on my YouTube channel, there's this one theme that appears across all of them. And I'm deeply amusical. 
So I outsourced that to my very talented musical friends. But every now and then I'll do a stupid video and I will be like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if Howard did a remix of the theme for this um, video? So I did one about, you know, mass mistakes from 6,000 years ago. And he wrote a Sumerian remix of the stand-up mass theme. <laughs> one time I'm like, can you do me a version of Murder, She Wrote, stand-up mass theme? And he did that. <laughs> and then, then for this one, I wanted a James Bond style theme and i was like wow for the first time ever i feel like i need vocals and i thought well there's no one <laughs> no one i know who's more overqualified for this ridiculous task than helen arnie so i was like hey helen because you know howard i'm like howard's writing me a james bond version of the stand-up mass theme do you want to collaborate with him and add some lyrics to it and I said yes before you reached the end of the sentence, I think. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I have literally always wanted to write a James Bond theme or more specifically something that is definitely not a James Bond theme for copyright reasons, but for most people sounds like Correct. a James Bond theme. Uh, and I thought this is, I, I've always wanted to do this, but I also thought this is not enough of a challenge. What I want to do is write a Bond theme that is based on your channel theme that already exists. So uh, taking your current stand-up math theme tune, adding new words, adding a melody and making it all fit together perfectly. So when you listen to this song, you're hearing two things at once just to see if I can get some of that satisfaction mm. and some of that endorphin rush in someone listening uh, where they hear something they recognise and something they don't recognise and seeing them fit perfectly together. I'm like, oh, this is the best challenge I've had this whole pandemic like a protractor on a coaster this is something i've always wondered about you can hear a james bond theme and you just know straight away that it's james bond like what is it about a james bond theme that makes it a james bond theme same with like i don't know tim minchin or something like you'll be watching matilda the musical and you'll just hear something you go oh that's so tim minchin like, what is it about specific sounds that make it that thing well I prepared for this challenge by just mainlining a lot of Shirley Bassey. Because um, <laughs> there are certain things that I think make a Bond theme. And Howard knows many more of these than I do. But this was a lot of my thinking as well. Do you know, I think what we should do is we should listen to Matt's theme. Okay. And um, you can hear how little it sounds like a Bond theme. And then we can... Hey. That's not an insult. It doesn't. <laughs> um, and then we can talk about what Howard and I did to try and make it into a Bond theme and then add another song on top. Um, Lindsay, our wonderful producer, um, is going to play in uh, just that section of Matt's theme tune where there's this like chip tune melody, sounds a bit like Tetris. Um, uh, if you could play that bit, Lindsay, then we can all hear what I was working with. It's funny, it's quite evocative of that feeling of like, oh, I've accidentally clicked on a Matt Parker video. Yeah. You know, and it's... <laughs> it's like when I used That's... to work in a comedy club and the, uh, the last track that was always played before the first act walked out on stage oh, yeah. was Supergrass pumping on your stereo. Wow. And just yeah. even hearing that song nowadays yeah. makes me incredibly anxious. <laughs> like, I think I've done that Overload, well. like something bad is about to happen <laughs> and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. It, it just fills me with dread. <laughs> That's just what the, the inside of my head sounds like at all points in time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that doesn't really sound like a Bond theme, right, Steve? Marks no. out of 10 for how much of a Bond theme that sounds like. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you see why this was a good challenge yeah. right so there's a few different things to change to make this into a bond theme firstly the original melody mm -hmm. secondly the music and the instrumentation or what it what instruments it's played on and thirdly there's the words um so melody like it's quite a complicated melody to start with and although it's on a very simple chord progression like the chords and the harmony are quite 
simple and they don't do anything too unexpected. It doesn't sound really quirky, does it? It sounds quite straightforward. Yeah. Um, the like melody the is yeah. really fast moving. And that was interesting because um, I had to try and write something that fitted in the gaps Ooh. in the melody that already existed. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be able to hear what was going on. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. And the main thing we decided to do was just slow the heck down. The whole thing got slowed down. Um, the second thing we did was trying to change the music. Now, this is like what you said about what a Bond theme sounds like. There's a couple of things that a Bond theme always sounds like, and you can throw in your suggestions as well. Like, it's always quite a slow tempo, like quite a yeah. slow speed. Um, there's always real instruments playing instead of electronic instruments. That's the main big difference. Um, and they always have this kind of epic sound. Mm. They always have a long flowing lyrical line. Mm. Uh, they always have like a bit of um, full orchestra, a bit of like band as well going on. So it, it sounds like, I think it sounds expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, that's a, yeah. a musical Not expression. Like my channel. Yeah. Bond yeah. themes don't sound like they were recorded in someone's bedroom, right? They sound like they were recorded in Abbey Road or some massive studio with loads of people, no expense spared. So I think sounding expensive is something that it really is. And I, I've no idea how Howard managed to do this because he literally did record it in his bedroom. Um, <laughs> uh, and also, the main thing, a Bond song has a hook line in the chorus that is... Always, I say always within errors, <laughs> the same name as the film title. Oh. And people are tweeting exceptions to that rule at us right now. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> every exception under the sun is being tweeted at us right now. Also, Bond themes sound a little bit sinister, I find, a yeah. lot of the time. So we need to get a bit of sinister in. So that hook, that thing of having the hook line in the chorus that's the same name as the film title for recognition, for marketing, for PR, for all sorts of reasons. Um, Matt needed to give me the title of the video. Um, you gave me a title and that's what I worked with. Matt, what was your title? Yeah. Uh, digits are forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Which I had a long list of pun <laughs> um, James Bond titles. And that, that was the one that won. Uh, I remember quite a lot of them. I think I suggested a bunch. Octagony. Okay. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> the man with the golden ratio. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good. Live and let pie. Um, <laughs> Live and let pie. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the man with the golden sum was another option that I, oh, wasn't as popular. That's also good. Also but yeah, good. Uh, from Russia with a zero score in tennis. That one never took off. <laughs> but <laughs> So uh, Matt gave me the title. And then I watched a draft version of his video so that I could kind of try and pick up some of the, the themes of the video. So like the, the video is, is basically about numbers that have loads of zeros in front of them, yeah. like lead zeros and how that's an interesting property. I mean, in a sentence, it's about things called digitally delicate primes, which are prime numbers where if you change any digit to any other value, they cease to be prime. And specifically ones where if you change any of the lead zeros to be any other value, it will cease to be prime. So the fact that all numbers have an infinite number of lead zeros was a key part of the video, which is why it was digits are forever. There are infinitely many zeros. And that makes sense with the fact that uh, 007 has two lead digits. Two lead zeros. No one addresses this in the Bond franchise. I mean, really, Never. if we're talking definitions, it should be zero, 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 infinitely many zeros, double zero seven. seven. Yeah. Like, Why isn't that he just called seven? More... Should be called seven. Yeah. It, it could either be called seven or infinitely number of zero yeah. seven. Like, I'd, and they say O, a... O is the letter when they're <laughs> zeros, zeros are the number. Maybe the it's letter. like a phone number where the numbers don't actually mean anything. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It's a counting system where they were expecting to lose 999 agents at some point. <laughs> and then what? Do they cycle back again? I think they cycle back. over. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which person goes, oh, wow, I've got 001. I'm the first eight. Oh, no. <laughs> there's, there's been a few before me. <laughs> so that's what I had to work with, right? And I think with all of that together, um, I think we should ask Lindsay to play 
the Bond theme that I came up with. And you can tell me whether I've successfully created a Bond theme. Use your mind and you will find countless zeros before each number starts. Though that explains it hurts my brain. Digits to infinity fill those parts to the left. It's not bereft. Zeros continue till whenever. Do you know how far they go? Digits are forever. Digits are forever. I mean, it's just pure Bond, isn't it? It's just pure Bond. Whatever you did made it Bond. Bond. By the way, because we're screen sharing, when Lindsay played it, I could see the artwork. I don't know who put the effort in, but it's like the graphics from the beginning of a Bond (laughs) movie, you know, with all the abstract (laughs) lines and stuff, which is fantastic. I mean, I don't know if anyone would get to appreciate that except for me in that moment, but I'm very glad you did it. The entire (laughs) opening sequence is an animated Bond. Oh, okay. All right, great. (laughs) Sequence, yeah. I think this is telling you a lot about Uh, whether a man with 1.5 million subscribers watches another (laughs) channel with a mere million subscribers. Uh, I try not to, Uh, but I mean... He turns off when he hears the theme. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's very useful in that way. (laughs) (laughs) Matt and I are not the only people who get anxiety when they hear that theme. (laughs) Reach for the mouse. Reach for the mouse. Right, so we're uh, successful, right? Howard has done an incredible job, right? And... The thing that I love most about it is it works as a Bond theme. But if you listen to it enough times, as I'm sure the internet has, <laughs> you will start to notice that there yep. is that do, 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 yeah. do, 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 tucked in the middle. In the second time, <laughs> yeah. in the second nice verse, it plays at the same time and it fits perfectly. And it's like, yes, I've created my own version in audio form of things fitting perfectly together in other things. Yeah, that was the weird thing. It's like you're listening to it and you go, wait, hold on. Did I? Oh, no. Wait, hold on. Because <laughs> you think you've heard <laughs> a different... It's a bit like when you go and see a brass band and they play a pop song. And you go, wait, what is that? What is that? What is it? Because it's just like <laughs> yeah. a just slightly different version. And you're, you're listening to it going, I know this song. And why is it yeah, making yeah, me yeah. want to stop a video? <laughs> <laughs> I think this kind of works. The reason I like it and the reason it's so satisfying, it's like when you write a joke or um, see a piece of artwork that has two different ideas juxtaposed on each other. And you get that satisfaction of recognizing two different things at once and your brain going like pow 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 oh two different things i've not seen together before oh and you get it's it's almost like the satisfaction of like finishing a jigsaw and you with get this beautiful picture but you also yeah <laughs> matt's matt's suddenly like yeah i can associate with this <laughs> when you finish a jigsaw and you look back and you see the picture and you're like oh oh it's yeah. done oh i like looking at this picture um, but you've also got the intellectual and physical satisfaction of having finished something and fitted it all together, right? Mm. Um, I mean, this is this is maths. We're describing maths. It's yeah. finding unexpected connections and patterns between yeah. seemingly unrelated topics. Oh, I've made audio maths. Uh, by the way, audio I am maths. definitely not the only person who has ever done this. Uh, it, obviously, Lin-Manuel Miranda does it uh, a lot. Uh, but... Uh, I uh, I asked on Twitter and I got so many suggestions of pieces of music that have done similar things, putting the tune of one thing to the tune of another or changing the melody or changing the chords and stuff like that. There's not so many that do this exact same thing, which is taking a tune by someone else and then layering a completely new melody on top, mm. but leaving the old tune. Um, and that, but there's a couple of really good examples. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. So again, you can tell me all the things I've missed off the list, but don't worry, I've, I'm not even trying to make this comprehensive. Um, one of my favorites, Barry Manilow, Could It Be Magic? You're all aware of the song, Could It Be Magic? Mm-hmm. Covered by Donna Summer and Take That. You won't realize until you listen to the original Barry Manilow version that the entire song is based on Chopin's Prelude in C minor, Opus 20 for solo piano. 
and Barry Manilow just nicked it and wrote some words over the top. And that's why it's one of the most extraordinary songs in pop music because it has these huh. bizarre chord changes that are unlike any other pop song. It does this really weird stuff. It goes to these really weird places. And it's because he basically nicked a piece of classical music and then slung his words over the top and called it pop. Genius. Um, perhaps a more sophisticated version of what you're saying is uh, the fact that 50 Cent in the club is based <laughs> on the Thomas the Tank Engine theme. <laughs> have you have you heard those played together? It's really good. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, like I'm not sure if it counts if it's unknowingly done. Do you uh, well... really think that was knowingly done? Like, because the, the thing is, right? Um, I had a conversation with Howard Goodall, the composer of the QI theme tune, on Twitter about this because someone else pointed out that the QI theme tune at Christmas they layer. A Christmas tune over the top. I think it's Jingle Bells. Oh. So the QI theme and oh, yeah. Jingle Bells work perfectly together. And people were like, was this on purpose? Did you write it to fit with Jingle Bells? Did you take Jingle Bells, write the song to fit and then eject Jingle Bells and only put it back in at Christmas? And he was saying, no, no, no. It's just a really simple chord progression. So it's actually quite easy to make lots of different tunes fit over a simple chord progression right. because there's not so much to clash against. Um and he said, yeah, it was kind of a nice coincidence, but that when he writes his musical theatre or his, his big musical productions, he tries to make all of the tunes fit together just as a kind of intellectual exercise. Oh, when the chord yeah. progression is quite simple, and I'm not suggesting that like um, a lot of pop music it has simple chord progressions, but you know, it's not all Barry Manilow. Um, <laughs> it's quite easy to make one tune of one thing to fit on top of the other, yeah. but it's not quite the same as like taking something specific and writing something to fit perfectly over the oh, top. Definitely, yeah, yeah. So if you want more examples of this, obviously I'm going to put loads in the show notes for you to go and find different um, pieces of music, pop music, classical music. Obviously classical music is where a load of this happens. Like it's standard in classical music. It's uh, a really key part of the creative process is like fitting stuff in that shouldn't fit together. One of my favorites is the Ave Maria, which might be a piece of music that a lot of you are familiar with. Um, Charles Gounod in 1853 took a piece of music from 1722 by J.S. Bach, just wholesale nicked it, slung a tune on top, uh, which is you know, it's just so Barry Manilow but the place where this happens the most to a mind-boggling degree to the point where it's expected and if it doesn't happen that's a hallmark of like maybe someone hasn't really thought about this enough and that is in musical theatre and in opera which is the area I'm living in at the moment it's not a bonus feature to have tunes that fit together it's like the whole reason for it to exist yeah um and within that, there's so many examples that I can give you. Like one of my favorite is Bernstein and Sondheim's West Side Story, where like anything that happens pretty much in the entire musical has a bit of music that goes with it. And when two things from different parts of the show happen together, the two bits of music are blended together as oh. well. And it's just an absolutely mind blowing three dimensional audio jigsaw. It's incredible. Um, and obviously, we don't talk about Bruno. It has all of the reasons that hearing two things that you recognise layered on top of each other is satisfying, but it has it multiplied by about 10. So maybe that's why my daughter loves it. Maybe. Maybe she doesn't even realise on a conscious level yet that that's why she loves it. But either way, I think it explains some of our current obsession which in about two weeks time i'm pretty sure will be replaced by something entirely different but for now <laughs> we're living our best in canto lives <laughs> well there you are if you want to listen to that remix or the bond version or just the original theme we'll have links to all of those below and you can see them in situ on my channel which i now realize why it's often described as the opera of um of youtube it's <laughs> yeah it's never described that way. All right, it's time to take this episode and fit it into its perfectly matched cubby hole that's got the end written on it. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to Acast for helping us squeeze so perfectly into the Acast Creator Network. 
Don't forget to check out the show notes for loads of extra detail, like more about the puzzle pretenders that Matt has been exposing, and a list of even more matchy matchy melody musicy things <laughs> to make you feel good. All that is linked in the podcast description, and it's available at festivalofthespokenerd.com forward slash podcast. We're also coming very close to the end of this series, so you're running out of times to perfectly match clicking with the subscribe button on your podcast app. So please do subscribe before it's too late. It's the best way to get new episodes, this series, possible future ones. And of course, you can find all of series one as well. And if you want to get in touch about anything to do with this podcast or what you've heard in this episode, we're on all the social media stuff. And you can email us, podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com. Until next time, bye. 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 A podcast of unnecessary detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould and Matt Parker. Our series producer is Lindsay Fenner, who also produced this episode. Our theme music is by Howard Carter, and we are proud to be part of the Acast Creator Network. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.